Welcome to our Mars episode of Rebellion's Educational Series. We have Dr. Anita Singhupta, super brilliant professor at USC, who used to be one of the integral professionals behind the Mars program, uh, was a part of the Venus program, uh, then did uh, work actually on asteroid exploration. I know her, her thesis was on, uh, I believe it was the ion rocket engine. And so, you know, we are so lucky to have, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Right. Pleasure is all ours. So, you know, let's start off with uh, the big question. When do you think there will be life on Mars? Well, it is still a question of scientific debate as to whether or not um, there is still life. It is potentially that it's in the subsurface. I think there was a recent finding that shows that there are subsurface lakes now, uh, probably high saline constant lakes. So if we're able to interrogate that region at some point, maybe we'll find some kind of microorganisms living there. And it's also a question of debate as to whether or not there could have been life in the past. Obviously, we're not talking about life like you and me, but more like microorganisms. So um, if those things pan out, that's fantastic. Certainly the environment appears to be habitable, but I think that probably the first sentient life will be human beings who travel to Mars the next few decades. Will Perseverance give us any information on these potential uh, lakes or is that something further down the road? So I think those measurements have been um, extrapolated from measurements that are coming from orbiting satellites around Mars because they're able to do um, sort of like radar type of penetration type of measurements. We could potentially design in the mission in the future that could um, access those things, but it'd be complex because you'd have to find one and then sort of drill into the surface to get to it. Um, but Perseverance will have many instruments that will support the understanding of prior life on Mars. Is that LIDAR you're referring to, L-I-D-A-R? Yeah, so there's, um, there, I don't want to speak specifically about that European spacecraft measurement, but, uh, but LIDAR can be used to penetrate the subsurface. Oh, really? Oh, that'd be very interesting. Interesting indeed. What are you excited about when it comes to perseverance? So one of the... Um, holy grail for Mars exploration is to do Mars sample returns. So Perseverance is going to be collecting and caching a sample uh, for eventual return to Earth and analysis in Earth-based laboratories. Oh, wow. Very, very cool. Is that related to the laboratory that you built for ISS? Our viewers should know that you were integral behind a physics laboratory that is now part of the International Space Station. So amazing. Your career is just really as amazing as they come, Dr. Tim. Oh, thank you. No, that, that's a very different type of experiment. It was an atomic physics experiment. Um, so very apples and oranges, but most things that we do in the space program are super exciting. Oh, wow. Uh, very cool. Very cool. So tell us about the bacteria on Mars. Apparently there's been some bacteria, which gives people hope that there was life you know, at some point uh, previously. Can you speak about that? Um, there hasn't been anything of that nature discovered so far, simply because the rovers haven't had the type of equipment on board to be able to make those kinds of measurements. Oh, sorry. They have. So we'll need going forward a better uh, camera or with, with the, the ability to capture this potential bacteria. So that, that has not been documented, but there's, there's been assertions that there is this bacteria and we, we'd need obviously to, to capture that. And so is that something that Perseverance will be able to do or is that a future mission? Yeah, so there's been no measurements or um, of anything like that. Uh, what they have found is the presence of organic uh, molecules. Oh, wow. Interesting. Organic molecules. Can you speak to the difference between uh, organic molecules and bacteria for our audience? That would be lovely. So organic molecules are the building blocks of life as we know it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an organism. So for example, um, plastics are made of organic molecules, but obviously plastics are not a living organism, but they are evidence of you know, past life in that sense. So um, it's the building blocks, but not necessarily the actual thing. Oh, wow. Such a, such a huge difference that isn't always you know, so clear in, in, in the press. And so that's really interesting and really important to know that. So you know, bacteria would be a much, much bigger find. And so there hasn't been really any evidence of that yet at all. Okay. So. No, and, and the reason for that is that a life detection equipment um, or, or experiment is very complicated. It assumes that you understand what the life form is going to be like, and that you would have to basically measure that it's able to eat something and then reproduce. And so that sort of scientific equipment or instrument um, has not been sent and has not yet been created. 
So you've done a lot of work with asteroids. Do you think that there's any potential that we could learn from asteroids? One, could we, is there ever an asteroid that we could live on that might have, you know, a depreciation rate of 200 years and so provide a nice surface for us? Or is that something too far off? So there is a lot of interest in asteroids uh, from a scientific perspective because it shows you the building blocks of planets, basically when the solar system first formed, and also they contain a lot of minerals. And so if you're thinking about creating a space-based society, you would want to set up infrastructure in space. And so asteroids could be part of that infrastructure and you could mine them for materials. Oh, oh, sorry. So the potential for asteroids is really very great, actually. It is, and uh, I, I'm a huge science fiction fan, as you can tell by <laughs> my background, and uh, The Expanse, which is a series uh, of books as well as a series on television, is about human beings as they expand into the solar system, and they actually do live on those asteroids. Oh, wow. Very interesting. So are you more scientifically excited by Mars or by asteroids that we have not yet interrogated? So I think they're both really interesting. And so my PhD thesis work was on the development of ion engine technology, specifically for the Dawn mission, which visited um, Vesta and Ceres, one of them being an asteroid, the other one being a protoplanet. So I think they're both incredibly important things to study in our solar system for different reasons. So I like them both. Well, speaking of your work, I, I was always very interested in the parachute that you developed for the rover. And how were you able to make those measurements of wind and you know, the, the environment? Uh, it seems like such an impossible task. Uh, can you give us a little you know, background on that? So one of the challenges of planetary entry, descent, and landing is that you're going to go through the atmosphere of another planet. And so you would like to have some information as to what that atmosphere is ahead of time in terms of how does it change as a function of altitude? How does it change during the time of year? What are its properties like temperature, pressure, density, and what is it made out of? And so over the course of the past 30 years or so, we've been developing better models of the Martian atmosphere. And so those models go into the autopilot pilot um, for the entry, descent, and landing system so that you are making measurements of how fast you're going, how much you're slowing down, but you also have a model of what the density is of the atmosphere, so you're not flying blind, as it were. Very cool. It is really so awesome. So also now that we're on your development, tell us about the atomic laboratory that you built for the International Space Station. Such an amazing endeavor. Love to do a little more. Yes, it that was a mission that I led for almost five years, um, and it was to create an experiment that would go inside the International Space Station to create a Bose-Einstein condensate. A Bose-Einstein condensate, most people don't know what that is. If you do know what it is, then you get your nerd uh, gold star. <laughs> but it is another state of matter, and it's a very dilute gas, which is condensed to a really cold temperature, and all the gas particles are actually bosons, which means they can occupy the same quantum state, and so they behave um, like a super atom as opposed to a collection of individual atoms. And we can learn more about the nature of matter by creating this at this really cold temperature because they're almost at absolute zero. Oh, I mean, would splitting them be easier at an absolute cold state? So um, at this really cold state, they end up all condensing. So just how you have like a, in, in water, you have water vapor, then it condenses into a liquid and then it condenses into a solid. This is another type of phase change, but it's for a gas, which is very, very dilute, which then condenses into the state and it behaves in a very orderly fashion. So it behaves as a superfluid and it also behaves as a superconductor. What can we do with a superfluid? So um, when um, it behaves in this really orderly fashion, it actually doesn't consume as much energy. So with a superfluid like my cup of coffee here, if it was the superfluid coffee, if I spun a spoon around in it and I took the spoon out, it would keep on spinning infinitely because it wouldn't have um, sort of energy losses as a result of viscosity because it's the superfluid. So there are ways to translate that into creating more efficient energy systems, batteries, for example, or transfer of power across power lines with uh -huh. losing less energy. Oh, wow. Now, energy is something we're very interested in. Constantly, all of the robotic CEOs that come on say the same thing. Robotics is being handicapped by you know, how quickly we're innovating battery technology. And until we can provide you know, power sources that give you know, robots significant time to live, you know, they don't really have much field time yet. And so that's been you know, really the issue. So you know, it's really interesting potential for energy that we can come up with from the stars. So are there potential energies that we could harness from 
asteroids, you think? So I, it's a, an area that I'm now focused in, um, in terms of my research, which is uh, green transportation and then the alternative green energies, which would support that. And so the interesting thing is one of the best ways that we can create better stored energy for vehicles is by using hydrogen fuel cells. And hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, right? So in that sense, uh, we do have an infinite energy supply as so we can harness that hydrogen and turn it into a gas, turn it into a, a liquid and, and put it into a fuel cell. Um, but in in space, if depending on your proximity to the sun, you can use the sun's radiation to generate electricity using solar cells. Well, speak, um, so pr probably, if you were on an asteroid, you might um, use solar cells. Well, speaking of the sun, you know, uh, you did work with the Venus project. Venus is, you know, about what you know, hundred thousand, you know, miles from Earth versus forty thousand from Mars. So, you know, nearly two and a half times further than Mars. Is that something doable in the foreseeable future? Oh, so Venus is uh, one planet in from us and then Mars is one planet out from us. And so I did lead the design of an entry system for a potential Venus lander. Uh, and we're very interested in Venus because it's actually very similar to Earth in terms of its size, in terms of its gravity, in terms of its initial composition. But Venus as a planet experienced a runaway greenhouse gas effect. So one of the reasons why we're interested in visiting Venus um, with the scientific robotic mission, for example, is to better understand how Planet, climates change at the planetary scale. So it's something that is very interesting right now. So how much further will it take to get to than uh, Mars? Uh, is, is oh, it's a lot. It's a lot easier to get to the Mars uh, okay. because um, it, it's closer to us than Mars is. Um, and there's been several missions to Venus, um, a few orbiters around the planet, as well as a Pioneer Venus mission. I guess that was probably in the oh my gosh, I'm going to get my decade wrong. Probably the late 1980s. Forgive me if I get that wrong. Uh, but we sent uh, a lander to the surface. There are actually three of them. Um, it was called Pioneer Venus. And the Russian space program also sent a whole variety of landers to the surface of Venus. So it's something that was very interesting a couple of decades ago, but then people focused on other planetary bodies. But now it's becoming interesting again because of the finding of phosphines in the upper atmosphere, which potentially could Well, Paul, I, I was uh, siding distance from the sun. I apologize. Uh, Venus is... Uh, sorry, my, my numbers were distance from the sun, not distance from Earth. So, yes, uh, apologies on my uh, incorrect uh, citations earlier. So, let's talk about your current work now. Uh, you know, hydrogen fuel cells. You know, what is it? Let's, let's talk about that. And, uh, you know, it's so interesting. What type of energy output can we look at versus, you know, a typical gallon of gasoline? So it, it, the best way to compare it is like what would be the equivalent to an electric vehicle. So right now electric vehicles are powered by batteries. And so you want to be able to match the same performance, the same range that you can get with a battery. But with a fuel cell, you have the advantage of having higher energy density, which means that it will consume less mass. And my particular interest is for the purpose of aviation, because right now airplanes which want to fly just off of batteries are limited to only about an hour of flight time, which is not very useful for most flights that you and I might want to take. So with fuel cells, we should be able to increase that by a factor of two, a factor of three, if not more. And so will these contribute to more efficient uh, Mars missions in time with better battery cells? They could. Um, the challenge, of course, is that um, the advantage of a fuel cell is that it can be refueled with hydrogen, but that requires an infrastructure, right, that you would go and drive up to the pump, uh, the hydrogen pump, um, either on the airfield or at a gas station, which you can actually do in Southern California. Um, so with Mars, you would have the challenge of not having that infrastructure. So it may not be the best solution for something which is on a distant planet right now without having the infrastructure, but it's a great solution for here on Earth. Wonderful. Well, this was such an awesome conversation, uh, Dr. Sengupta. As always, you're the best, and I, you know, I wish you staying safe in these crazy times. Same to you, and uh, I uh, look forward to being in New York City again one day sometime soon. <laughs> Definitely. Come to see you. Bye. Bye-bye.